Father, we, we do. We thank you for uh, the opportunity to come into this uh, building as the church to worship you, Father, as we um, uh, collectively uh, look at um, the Christmas season. But, Father, of course, today as we, we, we look at a text so somewhat unrelated, but, Father, still uh, part of your gospel, uh, we, we lift up the many, many, many saints in this room right now who have had to say goodbye here recently. Uh, it, it, it just seems like there has been one right after the other. And uh, we, we just, we pray for uh, the Spirit. We, we, we pray for uh, Him to, to uh, offer up those prayers that, that only He can uh, with groans that we can't even understand as He prays for God's will. Uh, we, right now we lift up um, the McLeans as they travel uh, to the hospital to, to be with their grandmother, Father. Uh, I pray for peace with her situation and peace with the situation with, with my own grandmother, with Dana's grandmother, um, and uh, guidance and wisdom from those who make decisions from the family to the doctors. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, as I was walking out of uh, the children's church, and by the way, I talked, when I talked to the children's church was about discipline, which is kind of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, one of the first questions I asked the kids were, uh, who in here likes to be punished? And surprisingly, there was at least three kids that raised their hands. Uh, and I'm going to point, point them out so that parents, you can, you can help them. They like this. Sarah, you know one of yours did it. Uh, you I can, can probably guess which one. You probably can't guess. And uh, Misty, one of yours did. Which one do you think? It was Emily. Very good. And one of mine uh, also. Connor and uh, <laughs> and one of the Smiths. One of them did. Which one? One of them would be right there. She would have been in there. Yeah. That's it, why I'm confused because the one that I thought it was. Well, it, it was it was Nathan. I don't think he knew what he was talking about. Just, <laughs> whenever you ask a question, his hands up. I, I mean. <laughs> and I asked, I asked the kids, I said, how many, of, how many of you think your parents punish you just because they're mean? You would be surprised at the number of responses I got there. That was, <laughs> yeah, but there was very few kids there that was like, no, it's out of love. Although your oldest boy that's over there did, did explain to the kids that it was out of love. And, uh, then they got into a hot debate. <laughs> yeah. but anyway, as I was walking out, I think because... I was like, your daddy forgot this. So I think he was kind of like giving up, just kind of like, I, I don't know. He didn't want to get punished, so. <laughs> I knew that was there. Does anyone know how to set these rat traps? No, I I'm going to set this one. I, does anyone hate setting rat traps? I do. I, I hate, this is says a mouse guard. I bought this the other day, and I'm thinking, mouse? This is not a mouse trap. I'm, I, if I sit this for a minute, I think that's overkill. I think that would be like cruel and unusual punishment for a mouse. There like, is I'm gonna, no such a thing. Huh? There is no such a thing. Sarah loves mice. I'm going to try to set this thing. I hate setting these things, by the way. I told you I hated it! Hold on, I'm going to try it one more time. It only hurts for a little bit. Yeah. Just initial. <laughs> <laughs> That's my worst part about set of mice traps, baiting it after the fact. I mean, how do you even do it? Um, mouse guard. There's got to be a better way to kill mice than this, this thing. Uh, the glue traps are fun, but they, you come later and they're still alive and they're happy. And then what do you do? How many of you use glue traps but you still throw them away alive? It's like you want to be you want to be humane, so you glue them to a board that if you take them off, it's going to rip off their flesh. There's nothing humane about those things. Mickey has a little traffic accident afterwards. What kind of cool? So is it that you like to watch? Is that it? <laughs> no. Is it like to watch? It's, it's like I don't get like to get caught in the traffic. Oh man, that, that hurt too. Um, <laughs> I pop myself. Uh, we used to do the live box mouse traps. I before this was back after I got out of the military, I worked with my stepfather who had a little pest control business on the side, and he um uh, 
he did. He, he, he had these boxes, and what we would do is uh, take the box, and you look in there, if there was a mouse in there, you just did this, snap, like that. It would kill him. The mice are really fragile creatures and stuff. So, the purpose of this mousetrap is to demonstrate something that I think that common sense, okay? And also to demonstrate something that is not so common sense, okay? I think that everybody in this room um, would agree. In fact, everybody in this country, for the most part, would agree that there is a cause and effect to life, okay? That... You, you, you make decisions, you act on those decisions, and there is an effect that happens uh, to your decisions. There's, there's good causes, there's good effects, and there are bad causes, there are bad effects. I'm surprised in my financial counseling ministry, which is not so much about numbers as it is really about spiritual uh, sense, how very few people seek counseling during this season, financial counseling. But January 1st, oh, yeah. boom, they're right there. Why? Because everyone's making stupid decisions now, and the last thing they want to do is come and talk to me about it because they know I'm a, I'm a, I'm a humbug, buddy. You come up to me like you ain't spending any money. You need to keep the lights on. But anyway, there are a lot of people who are spending money they don't have, and in January, <laughs> that would have been a heck of a mouth. There's going to be effect. So we all agree that there is this, and, and that's just one thing. I mean, if we are out there running like a crazy man, there's an effect. If we are um, spending time with our family, there's an effect. If we're not spending time with our family, there's an effect. We know cause and effect. What I think that is not so well known in America, and even in the church, and this is kind of why I'm bringing it to your attention, plus it was the next passage uh, in our Corinthian study, is that sometimes there is a God cause to something that we have done. That there is a punishment, Christians, for our sins. That sometimes, now I should try to bake this first, right? Okay. There are two of them. That's going to make a big mess if you open it. It's nice. Hey, that is, that, that's me. I am willing to take that risk. <laughs> I don't want candy bar anymore. Dude, these are fresh too. Can you smell? <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and bake this. The only one that's really tempting, though, is me. You know that, right? Now, if this does slip, there's going to be a nightmare here. Okay. Should we be filming this? Hate those things. So, um, the 
Bible says, and of course this is just a, an analogy, that God sets the mousetraps, that there is punishment from Him uh, in the Bible. And there are Christians, there may be Christians in here uh, that are more influenced by the world than they are squirrel. Sorry, I just saw squirrel. I had that ADD or whatever it is. It's like squirrels. Uh, go get that squirrel. See if you can get the, the thing off there. Squirrel. Uh, there are Christians who, who don't accept that. Don't believe that God would ever punish them for their sinful behavior. In fact, as John, John Sunday School was, are you getting the squirrel? No. Okay. <laughs> you, you want to go? Okay. I will if you want me to. Though. Okay. Some, some, some suggest that that's an Old Testament teaching, that God punishes sinners. Um, that's, that's old school, that's Old Testament. Testament. But as as God evolved over time, and, and, and He got more compassionate and stuff for us, and Jesus came, um, then He got all He got all sweet on us. Uh, and, and generally, like I said, those people probably who believe this one probably have not read the New Testament. Um, the idea of hell that's Jesus who brought us that. Okay. The idea of punishment is actually the demonstration of God's punishment is, is seen more with Jesus Christ on the cross than it is anywhere else in Scripture. So people who believe that that's Old Testament, they don't understand a clear Old Testament and New Testament teaching that God does not change. The God of yesterday is the same God as of today, and He'll be the same God tomorrow. So if there's anything uh, that, that the culture has communicated to you that God has changed and He's no longer like that, you, and you believe it, you are embracing what the culture teaches and not what God teaches. And I want you to know that because you're a fool. And I'll, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. So the text that I want you to read 1 Corinthians 10 does a great job, and this is New Testament, by the way, of communicating that to us. Okay? This is what it says. 1 Corinthians 10, 1, and I'm going to read like the first 10 verses, and then we'll talk about it, and I'll read the rest. Paul says this. He says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact. Okay, this is us he's talking to. I don't want you to be stupid about what I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, brothers, and I don't think God would would get mad if we put sisters in there too. Um, brothers, it's, it's communication of Christians. He says that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They are all of the same... They ate... It's hard to see in the dark here. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now these things occurred to them as an example to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters. As some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down and ate and drank and got up to indulge in pagan rubbery. We should not commit sexual morality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and got killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and they were killed by the destroying angels. Let me kind of break that down for you just for a second. I want you to notice real quick that there were four types of sins that uh, the apostle talked about. Um, one, the first one was what? Idolatry. Very good. What is idolatry? Is that you dance naked around the uh, golden cows that you put in your backyard? Okay. It is simply this. Putting something before God. We don't have a lot of gold cows in America, but we do have a lot of gold in America that sometimes we'll put before God. <coughs> We'll put sports before God. We'll put our... Here's the biggest God most people have. have itself. Day before God. Okay? And I think that's one of the reasons why we have this false gospel out there. That, that this health and wealth crud is that 
there's this idea, it, it's so natural that we are the most important thing, and God exists for one purpose, to make us happy and rich. That's idolatry. Okay? The other one is what? The first one was idolatry, first sin. The second sin is... Sexual immorality, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but we definitely see our culture is very open and very much embraced. They've embraced this idea that we are animals and that, you know what, if it makes you happy, go for it. And any of you that has any type of standards whatsoever, you're living in the dark age. You're living in the Old Testament. Well, the New Testament is very clear that there's a certain particular... You, you have desires, but don't take those desires outside of the parameter given in there. Did I knock that down? No. Okay. Because <laughs> I don't remember that, but I'm going to jump back with the mousetrap. You never know. Um, what was the third one? You had uh, idolatry, you had sexual morality, and you had the third. Testing. testing God. What does that mean, testing God? I mean, God was two plus two. Quick, now. No. Um, and we see this a lot. We see this a lot. We, I, I hear this in, 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 in church a lot. Uh, not so much with you guys, which is, which is a blessing. That we, we um, have you heard this? I want this job, and I just have to have faith that God's going to give it to me. So even though I don't see anything that's going to get me from this point to that point, there's this great chasm. I'm going to take a step of faith, and God is going to provide a bridge underneath me. Somebody was like, well, why is that wrong? He says, no, no, no. It's what I want is right there. Okay, it is my will that I have that thing, yet there's this great chasm there. I'm going to take a step of faith that God wants me to be happy, and He's going to give me the very thing that I want. You're testing God. You're testing God. You're saying God's going to provide a way to get me the things that I want. That's not what faith is. Here's what faith is. God says, this is my will. And even though there is this great chasm, you'll take the step. The difference is this. Who wants it? Does God want it for you? Then you better obey. Do you want it for you? Will you think that God exists for you? Okay, so that's the third one. So you got idolatry, you got sexual morality, you got the testing of faith. What's the fourth one? Huh? Grinding. You know what? I will bust my kids in their head. And they ain't here right now. I'm going to tell you what, I will bust my... I always forewarn them too, because I love them. I said, boys, we're going to go to Grandma's house for Christmas, okay? Uh, now, Grandma doesn't have a lot of money. So when you open up that present, and I don't care if it's soap on a rope, you better be happy you got soap on a rope. In fact, you better look at that soap on that rope, and you better, you, be, you know what? You better express gratitude. This is the best soap on a rope I ever had. I want to see it in your eyes. I want some passion. Go, Grandma! I'll put it around your neck and wear it with pride, like bling, right? That's soap on the road. Boom, yeah. <laughs> Don't you ever open a present and say this. That's all I got. You know how many people do that with God, though? They get life. They get another day. They get another breath. They've got family. They've got friends that love them. They got a church that loves them. They got all kinds of things that love them is there for them. And yet every single day they wake up and they cry and they complain. There's another word I want to use, but I won't use it because that's the old Marine Corps in me. And the scripture says I shouldn't be talking like that anyway, so I'm not going to do it. And they put it on Facebook. It's a sin. It is. Because you're taking away the glory as you're looking at that stuff. So those things are still sins. God doesn't change. He it still ticks them off. Okay? It's not that he just, he's not a mean God. He's not just, he, he doesn't want you to have any fun. Those are things that he says are unholy. Those are bad. It's absolute truth. These are wrong. It's not going to change right there. But I want you to notice on top of that, even more importantly, is who was he talking about? He says, this is Old Testament. He's talking about our forefathers. He's talking about the Jews. What was amazing in that text is he, is he ties these people, these Jews in the Old Testament, to who? Jesus Christ. He says that they, no, 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 no. They walked, but they drank from that spiritual rock, which is Christ. I'm not going to spend a lot of time there, but let me just say this. We look back at Christmas, we look 
back at Easter and we look at Christ from after the fact. We are saved because we look upon Jesus Christ and what he did and we, and we do. We believe in our heart that, that God raised him from the dead. We call him Lord looking back. The Jews of the Old Testament are saved if they looked forward to the cross even though they didn't understand the cross. I said a lot of stuff there. Let me just say this. They are just as much a child of God as we are if they look forward to salvation as we are a child of God, as we look back to salvation. Okay, you got that? Why is that important? Because Paul isn't talking about heathens. He isn't talking about a godless country who rejects God. He's talking about people who are adopted as his children. He said, these are the people who received punishment, as an example. So Christians say, God still will punish you. And the punishment can be as severe as death. Doug, the examples he gave us. He gave us the extreme. Death. Physical death. Of course, some Christians would say, whoa, that's kind of harsh. No, what did I say at the very beginning? God doesn't change. You know that, right? Let's go back all the way to the garden. What was it? On the day that you eat from this tree, and it was a tomato, the godless fruit from hell, snot packed, <clears throat> the day you eat that nasty snot packed tomato, or whatever you think it was, a fruit, you will surely die. That's a punishment. Did they die on that day that they ate the fruit? Yes. Spiritual death. Bam! Right there. What is spiritual death? Separation. That's what death is. Some of you are going, you're experiencing death right now of a loved one. You've said goodbye. I don't understand people who testify that says, that they want to have this big party when somebody dies. It's a celebration. The party's on that side, not this side. It's great that they're in heaven, but still here, you're separated. It sucks. God said, on the day you eat the fruit, you're dead to me. You're spiritually separated. That happens still to this day when we sin. In fact, Jesus warned you. He said, unless I, you're going to walk in this earth, you're still going to sin, and unless you allow me to come in and forgive you of that sins, that is, you admit those sins, and, and that you seek forgiveness, that sin's going to stay on you, and I can have no part with you. Though you were saved, though you had a bath, if your feet get dirty and you're not allowing me to cleanse that sin from you, there's that separation. There's saints in this room probably who think that God is with them, but they've got the sin that they won't repent of, and, and, or that they're stubborn, they're like, I'd rather have this sin on me. You're not in good, intimate fellowship with God. You can't be. That's what the Bible tells you. You need to seek Him. You need to say, God, forgive me the sin. Remove this from me, this passion, whatever. Get on your face, prostrate to the ground, towards the manger, which, which sits in the shadow of the cross, and beg for forgiveness. You need to. Until that day, you were separated. You're dead. Now, physical death, which we all receive one day, but some of us prematurely, because of sin, uh, that is a teaching throughout the New Testament, is, the, this is what I wrote down, and it's, 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 it must be genius, because I'm, well, that's a sin, I'm proud. Uh, or maybe I'm, I don't know. Spiritual sin, excuse me, Physical sin is the material manifestation of a spiritual condition. Now what did I just say? Your body takes a little bit of time catching up with the spiritual state. If I shoot John, and I wouldn't, because I love him, not like, you know, marriage love, but in a different type of love. But I shot him, and if I nicked a, a certain artery, even though he was still alive, he's pretty much dead. It's just going to take a little bit of time. That's what happens with our bodies right there. 
So one thing I want to tell you this right away is, and I want you to get this, every time God punishes you for a sin that doesn't result in your immediate death, it is an act of grace. I had one lady one time, and we were, and some of you, this, I'm a, I have, I'm, the sermon's not really that long today, in fact, uh, I'm a good, good way through, but we were at, I think we were at PABC, I don't remember who was preaching, but the pastor was preaching, and as pastors do, they were going on and on and on, and they long and stuff like that. The lady in front of me was going crazy. I mean, she was like, she's checking her watch, she's like, I can't believe this guy, she's just doing this, she was talking out loud, she was just, she's, he's got to shut up, it's, it's time, he doesn't, he have a clock, does somebody have a clock back there? And they were just going over and over, and it was kind of, it was kind of disturbing all the people around her, she was grumbling and she was griping. And as soon as he said, Amen, let's pray, boom, right there, she got up, she jumped up, and she ran to her vehicle. You remember what happened? Do you know this part? She had three flat tires. Now, it wasn't the deacon who hurt her. Okay? She had three flat tires. Not one. Not two. Three. Do I know if that was from God? I, I did not get a specific word from an angel, but that was punishment. However, a little logic, and I'll tell you that this woman got a little smack on the hand. Not because maybe the pastor was long-winded that day, but because she was grumbling and she was griping and she was taking away from the worship right there, she got popped. She did. Busted relationships, bankrupt, uh, disease, We get popped sometimes. Hebrews tells us that when we get popped, it's not fun. We don't like it. It doesn't feel good at the time, but later it produces the fruit. The thing is, and I want you to get this, every single time you get popped, it's an act of grace because what you deserve is death. It's death. And some of you may be thinking, and I hope this isn't the case, but you're like the kids next door, and you're saying, well, that's not from a loving God. And I would disagree. How many of you right now would think a parent was evil if they did not tell their kids what was right and what was wrong? How many of you know parents who don't really tell their kids what is right and what's wrong? I heard a guy the other day over this marijuana, this legalization of the marijuana. He says, well, I'm just going to let my kid grow up to a certain age and let him decide for himself when he gets up to that certain age what is, what is, what is right and what's wrong. My parents had that same philosophy when it came to spiritual sense. They said, well, let him grow up. When he's old enough to make the decision on what he wants, then let, he'll do that. And, of course, then they sent me to a secular school who taught me that there is no God. Okay, if you don't teach that there is a God, you don't teach that Christ is the Savior of the world, then by default, you embrace what else? Somebody else will teach it. Somebody else is out there teaching that. Right there. We have a world embracing it. They hate the idea of sin. They don't like the idea of punishment. They're preaching and teaching their message. If you don't preach and teach your mess that message, a good godly message inside the home, you're a bad parent. If you don't talk about consequences, you're a bad parent. If you don't pop your kid in the butt sometimes, you're a bad parent. Sorry, yeah, parents. I hear the amen for me to catch. Why? Because I'd rather get a pop on a hand today than jail tomorrow. I'd rather get a pop in the butt today than a ruined life tomorrow. Why don't why does the world which would for the most part embrace that idea except for a few whack jobs? But they don't apply the same standards to God. I would imagine, and this is this is outside of today's notes, that some of them never have moved past getting popped on the hand. 
I look at this young man right here, I see a couple young people right back there, and sometimes as a kid, you know that more than you know anything. I know that with Connor, when he was a little bit younger, it's like every single day on the hour, it's time for the pop. And he just come up, it's time. <laughs> I was, I'm going to act up. You know what I'm noticing about Connor, though, later on? Even Connor, we're having more of an intimate relationship. Why? Because he learned those things along the way. Some of you haven't moved beyond being popped in the hand by God because you haven't learned your lesson. And until you learn that lesson, you can't have that deep, intimate fellowship with them because you're like baby, okay? You're not ready for the good stuff. There is a better relationship coming to you if you'll just obey and learn. We don't apply the same standards we do on a parent as we do with God, and we need to. Because he is a loving father. And not only that, and I just ruined my Bible here. God warns us. 1 Corinthians 10 again. <coughs> Verse 11. These things that he just talked about in the Old Testament, these things in the Old Testament right there, um, are, are these things happen to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. Kyle learned the hard way throughout his whole life. What is right, what is wrong. He loved his brother enough to say, dude, don't do that, dad's going to pop you. And then all of their other brother enough to say, don't do that, do that. They learn the lesson over time. And the kids get smarter as they go on. Isabella is blessed. Four brothers who really do love her will tell her, like, no, you don't want to do that. <laughs> you don't want to do that. That's the lie. And of course, Isabella is going to be just like anyone else. There's certain lines she's going to cross, but other lines she can learn by example. God loved us so much that the punishment that he gave to our older forefathers, our older brothers, is an example of us not to cross that line. He warned you. So right now, I'm going to tell you right now. That Reese's Peanut Butter Cup looks good. It looks really good. I will, well, I kid you not, you guys, uh, I think it was Randy bought me this like one pound candy bar with Reese's peanut butter cup. And it was like, I looked at the back and it was like a kajillion calories. You know what I did? I figured out how many hours I would have to run on one day to eat one of them. And you know what? I ran. I ran. I ran 14 miles that day so I could eat that stupid candy bar. I will do it. I know that that candy tastes good. But I also know if you touch it, you might get popped. So don't touch it. God says the same thing. Listen, you might get over, you, you know, you might think you got away with it. But if you touch this, either by natural consequences of you touching it, you get popped, or I might pop you. I love you that much to pop you. Don't touch it. I'm getting too close, hang on. Bang, bang, bang. <laughs> He loves us enough to tell us, don't touch. The problem that we have is that we live in this world, and this world tells us, you can't stop. I was born that way. I was born to have that racist peanut butter cup. It's in my genes, and because it's in my genes, I gotta get it. I'm addicted. Have you ever heard that? I'm, I'm addicted, so I can't stop. It's, it's, it, 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 it's just, how many of you have been addicted to something? It's strong. Chocolate's got an allure over me right there. I can't stop. And because I can't stop, what do they tell you? Well, if you're going to be messing around with this stuff, put a glove on. Because <laughs> you're going to get mad. You know, I mean, it's going to get you, so you better protect yourself. So when you get got, you got something to stop it right there. Um, get you some tongs or something like that. Let's see. Get you like a little. There you go. Tell me I can't get this. I know I can get that off. Verse 12, it says, be careful how you stand, 
because you will fall. It, it amazes me, you know, and, and we do this with temptation. We do this with trial. I had one young man who came up to me one time, and, and uh, he got caught up in all this porn stuff. And uh, he, he, he went to it, and, and sure enough, he, he got away with it over and over and over. And one day, you know, we, we stopped using the tools and whatever, and we get very arrogant with it. And his wife came in and was devastated. And she was a godly woman. And there is that thing that lust in the Bible where, you know, though she didn't have to get divorced, he crossed that line. And that mousetrap snapped. About killed this man. And he's still suffering the consequences from it. You know, you think you're going to get away with it, but you're going to get caught. So you need to stop. There. Here's the truth about addictions. Here's the truth about you can't stop. The same people who told you that, they don't buy into this idea of sin. They don't buy this idea of that God punishes the sinner. They, they, they totally forgot that. So they said, you've got these desires. You're going to give in, so just give in. It's not what the Scripture teaches. Here's what the Scripture teaches. 1 Corinthians 10, chapter 13. <clears throat> so if you think... Um, Oh, that's verse 12. We, we, we talked about that standing call. It says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. Let me pause right there. There is no temptation out there that has seized you that is nothing more than common. There's no such thing as a supersized temptation. There's no such thing as, as though addictions are strong, there's no, though, though that the desires, the natural desires for copulation, if you will, are very strong, though the natural desires for success are really strong, there's no desires that seize you except what's common. You need to at least embrace this truth. You don't say no because you don't want to. Okay? And here's what I'm going to tell you today. That's fine. As long as you understand that there's consequences to your actions. And you're going to get popped if you keep it up and you don't repent and ask for forgiveness. Or shit, you'll probably, become, you'll probably become addicted. Brother Tim gave us a great testimony about addictions. It started with just getting away, just getting away, pop, and next thing you know, you've got the stupid mousetrap attached to you and you can't shake the thing. Why? Because your heart's been hardened and you've been drawn into it. And then the punishment is wrapped in double. God loves you enough to tell you don't. But he gave you the choice. God is consistent. If you want to eat the stupid fruit from the tree, go ahead. But there's going to be consequences. You're going to get God. You need to at least be honest and say you don't care because you want to get popped. God also loves us enough to give us relief. Look at verse 13. Uh, continues, says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. But then the end, and God is faithful. You're not. God is. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Let me tell you what that does not say, because I, I do hear this in this church. And I, and I want to clarify what this does not say. This does not say that you will not go through a, a, a period of trial or a period of pain that you can stand up to. There are so many people says, oh, I'm going through this, this, this pain in my life, and, and God would never allow me to go through pain that I won't be able to bear. Baloney. That's not, that's not a scriptural teaching. There are pains that you are going to receive in this life that you cannot stand up under. And you need to get that proud, arrogant stance of yourself out of your life because you are a dependent creature. God wants you dependent upon Him. He'll let you even have a thorn that you beg Him to keep away so that you will become more dependent on Him. That's not what it says. And here's what else it doesn't say. He doesn't say that temptation won't get you. He didn't say, well, there, there, you know what? There's not a temptation out there that won't draw me into that mousetrap. It's not saying that. If you stay around that stupid Reese's peanut butter cup, whatever your Reese's peanut butter cup is, just because I don't necessarily am tempted by it, and you are, though it is common amongst us all, everyone has their different temptations, their different things that are calling. I may struggle with one, you may struggle with others. The Reese's peanut butter cup is an analogy to so many different things. 
You stay around that temptation long enough, you will get sucked in. You won't be able to say no. God simply says this, I will always give you a way out. I will always give you a way out. You need to take that way out. It's real simple. Mine is always scripture. I pray that you're reading God's word. I pray that you're in it. I pray that you that you're devoted to it. That you think about it. That when you hear songs on the radio, what was that Christmas song I was hearing the other day? So be good for goodness sake. You're taking the Bible and saying that's not what the Bible says. Why would you be good for goodness sake? Be good because Jesus said be good. You know, change the stupid song. Be good because Jesus said so. Or you're getting up from Santa. Who doesn't exist here? Look, I should. Well, he might exist. I don't know. I don't know how we do with all that, but I don't know. Man, I may have messed up. Hand it back there so you can do it too. <laughs> I know. To me, it's always a scripture. Riding in, that, in the car and somebody's going 45 when it clear sign says 55. What are you born stupid? <laughs> and then I start talking. I guess if Jesus is wanting you there, he'd miracle you there. I'd start talking bad stuff like that. And I always get that scripture. In your hand, you're not sin. He said, don't be saying all these bad things. And, and though I'm tempted to give in to my anger and stuff like that, I've got that other doors right there. It's just full of scripture. That's what happened with Jesus, by the way, when he was tempted. His, his way around the temptation was this. This is what God says. 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 There's always a way out. How many of you right now, and I'm going to close here real quick. How many of you right now know of, you know your temptations? Yay? Yay? You're, you're in a better place than those who don't know what they're tempted by. Because you can prepare to look for a way out before it even comes. If you're a man, I'll just speak to the men real quick. Um, God has created you to be attracted visually right there. You know that. Guess who else knows that? People who make stupid commercials. Okay? You know what? Hardy's, eating a Hardy's hamburger doesn't make women look like that. Okay? <laughs> Why do they do that? I don't know. But they put the woman there, and it looks like she's making love to a stupid hamburger, and 90% of you guys are out there just like, oh, so nice. I just <coughs> fries with a cookie and ice cream. The Bible actually gave Job a command. He said, you look away. He said, I trained my eyes not to look lustfully at a woman. There's your way out. The minute it's there, bang, I'm on quicker than you. Keep a Bible right there on your dashboard. That's why I was good, because I was looking at them when they were like, that's right. There's always a way out. Talk bad about people behind their backs. You know what? There's a scripture for that. There's a way out. You know what the way is? How about saying nice about something? You've got that choice. There's always a way out. Get away from it. Or you can play with it. And you're going to get popped. Anybody want that? They can have that. <laughs> In case you're tempted, I'd like that. stupid things out there for mice. It's because, one, I hate mice. And I want them to die. Horribly. Why they don't put little barbs on here, I don't know. <laughs> now, after I got popped, I know why. There's got at least a little barbs on there. Maybe a little music box in here when it pops them. Na 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 na. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Goodbye. <laughs> but these are really for our own good. It comes to God. You know that, right? He wants you to choose what's right. He wants you to say, 
yes to Him. Because He loves you. And as you grow, and as you become obedient to small things, <coughs> there's a day that your relationship with Him goes to a level that, my goodness, you just can't imagine. Kyle, my boy, love him to death. But I am so thankful for that. <coughs> Mama may disagree. She likes them small. That's why she keeps having babies. Um, I think. I don't know. Lord's the water. We'll figure out how that comes about one day. <laughs> I like the fact that my boy's grown. I like the fact that Andrew's grown. Because we have a relationship that has moved past these little acts of discipline. And it is really a blessing to see him and Andrew make these decisions on their own that are God honoring, that are mature. And though, and though they went through the trials of hard knocks, they learned. Brothers and sisters, stop it. Learn from it. And embrace that relationship that you'll have with God. Let's pray.